Evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the uh, Pins Manor May committee meeting. And uh, Mr. Johnson, superintendent, will lead us today. Hey, okay, thank you, Mr. Hardesty. If you want to take a look uh, <clears throat> at this evening's agenda, uh, we have nothing this evening under program presentations, and we have nothing under negotiations. So let's start with curriculum. Uh, first, under 4A, uh, for next week, uh, we're requesting your approval for us to apply uh, for the 2021-22 uh, uh, flexible instruction days. Uh, so let me remind all of you what those are. So first, you've already approved uh, the calendar for next school year. Uh, in that calendar, we have four snow days built in. Uh, the flexible instruction days uh, prior to COVID uh, was given the opportunity by PDE to apply for five inst flexible instruction days, which means prior to COVID, um, if you had a, a snow emergency, if you had any type of an emergency, you had up to five days you could use in the school year. This district, uh, if, we, if you remember, we talked about it a year ago. Uh, we said we were going to apply, but then COVID came, and then the whole um, situation of every school could apply under 520.1 Act uh, that allowed uh, us to be flexible all year long. Uh, so uh, flexible instruction days, uh, we did not use and was shelved, um, but uh, we're clearly being told that since we're moving in the right direction, uh, that we will not be able to have you deem me the authority uh, to have the types of days that we had this past year. Uh, so what PD is, uh, again, offering um, for us to do is to apply for five. Uh, so picture this. So we have four built in the calendar for snow days by you allowing uh, administration myself to uh, submit for, for flexible instruction days, that would give us five more uh, that we would work with, giving us a total of nine uh, and still graduating uh, or ending the school year at that designated time that you approved the calendar already. So uh, again, you'll hear lots of people call it FID days. It's just flexible instruction days is what it stands for. Uh, so with your approval, uh, we would put that on the agenda for next week uh, for you to allow us to submit that application. Uh, PDE reviews, there's a number of questions I have to answer, um, but uh, would like to do that. Any objections from anyone for applying for those? Okay, uh, next 4B, uh, you will see that time of year uh, for us to approve graduates. So the 2021 uh, list is there uh, online or in your packet that you see. Uh, we have 63 graduates uh, listed. And also at this point, I've asked uh, Mrs. Dolges if she would just review uh, the things uh, that the uh, evenings or activities that will be coming up uh, for the class of 2021. So Mrs. Dolges, do you wanna go through those? Is she on there, Dave? I can't see from here if she's on. Yeah, see her. Oh, there she is. Okay. Okay. I will come back to her. How's that sound? You think she's in there, Mr. Gramling? Mrs. Dolges, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I got disconnected. <laughs> okay, no problem. I had just uh, uh, presented. Uh, the list of 63 seniors uh, for graduation. And if you want to review uh, all the activities for the senior class. Yes, yes, I can. Um, we are planning on holding um, out graduation outside. Um, graduation will be June 2nd. Um, if the weather starts, to, if the weather is rainy, um, we will move it to the next nice available day. Um, so if it's rainy on the second, graduation will be on the third and so forth. We will take the next nice available day. Um, it'll be outside seven o'clock at the stadium. Um, we will have baccalaureate service is at uh, seven o'clock on the 26th of May. Uh, May 26th will be baccalaureate service at six o'clock or seven o'clock at the high school auditorium. And we will have the senior awards banquet on June 1st in the uh, high school gym. Uh, we are having that in the gym and that will be a six o'clock start. Okay. 
Third is the committee meeting. Third is the committee. Yes. So I was just going to bring that up now. Uh, so my recommendation is this, <clears throat> that um, if you don't have a problem, what I would like to do is to uh, move uh, the committee meeting to the following Monday, uh, just in case uh, we end up moving uh, graduation. So graduation is on a Wednesday right now. Uh, but if we would have uh, a stormy evening uh, that we can't be outside, uh, I would like to move it to the very next night. And that's just what we're telling everyone. So if it rains on Wednesday, rains on Thursday, we'll move it uh, to Friday. Uh, hopefully we don't get that far out, uh, but uh, requesting that we would uh, move the committee meeting to Monday. Anyone have an issue with that? Because we'll have to advertise that if. And you may also, be saying, well, why outside? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I also wanted to add that on May 27th, um, I don't know if the board knows, but ICTC is holding their graduation at our stadium at 630 on May 27th. Um, if it rains on that evening, they are moving their ceremony indoors um, and it'll be live streamed from the high school auditorium. Um, so they, well, that's also something that we have going on at the district this year. Um, but I, Mr. Johnson was started to say, and I'll say we're holding it outdoors um, so that students can invite um, as many people as they want right now with the limitation, each senior would only be allowed to bring like two people um, with them with the capacity in the auditorium. Um, so with it being outside at the stadium, our plan is to use both sides of the stadium, uh, have the seniors and the faculty sitting on this on the field, and then use both sides of the stadium for the families and they can bring as many people as they would like them. ICTC uh, has not chose that option because uh, they don't want to move it to any other night. Uh, they want to have it uh, on the 27th and be done. Uh, so their plan is, is that um, if it's raining, as Mrs. Stoll just said, it, the graduates would be indoors and it would all be live streamed. No parent uh, will be allowed in the auditorium for ICTC commencement because they have 140 uh, to graduate uh, from ICTC. So no parents will be allowed in. Anything else, Mrs. Dolges? No, I think that's that's all I was going to report on the graduation. Okay, thank you. Anything else under curriculum? Any questions? You, you wanted the committee meeting change till uh, to the month, the following Monday. Would you do? Do we want to do that now or wait and see? Uh, no, we can. If you give me permission, we will advertise that to change it for June. But you got to advertise. Yeah, and we'll announce it next week too that we're changing June. Anyone object to that? Okay. Moving along to budget and finance, uh, we have uh, again uh, some online services uh, that we would like uh, for your approval for next year and is in the budget uh, for next year. First is 5A. Uh, you'll see a handout, it's approval for Zilla renewal. Uh, just to remind you what that is, that's our online program uh, for each student uh, in the high school uh, for their career plan, um, and that's a requirement of Chapter 339. Uh, so basically, it's an online uh, warehouse that students put in uh, all the requirements uh, for career planning. Uh, cost for that is $2,000, and that's an increase of $200 from last year. Any questions? Next online uh, service, uh, it's, it's asking you to approve turn in, turn it in uh, renewal. Uh, that's an online service uh, for students to actually submit their work and teachers uh, to review. Uh, again, it's uh, an online service that checks to see if any paper that's written is plagiarized. Uh, so a student will be able to uh, check that themselves before they submit the paper. Um, and in turn, uh, hopefully every single one of them would do that. Um, because then the teacher can actually also access that uh, online for the same reason. And that is $1,670 for the high school. Questions? Okay, next 5C, a cadence uh, for math and reading. Uh, you can see that is for the uh, elementary school assessment uh, for all students in the elementary. Total cost is $2,397.75. That's actually a decrease 
uh, from $1,283.75 from the year before. Questions on that? Okay. Next, uh, 5D, uh, approve uh, Harris School Solution Renewal. Uh, that is all of the uh, district's business office uh, software, uh, ProSoft, that's for budgetary accounting, requisitions, payroll, uh, personnel resources. Total cost uh, for that service is $13,426. That is an increase of $1,349 from last year. Questions? Okay. Next, 5E, approval of ESGI uh, renewal. Uh, that is also reading and math assessment used by all of our primary teachers. Uh, you can see it is listed there. Uh, 11 teachers in the primary access that. Total costs $2,343. Uh, that's a $313 increase from last year. Questions so far? Okay, next, 5F, uh, Cotton. Uh, that is for us uh, to uh, have a three-year agreement uh, with Cotton CPA and Associates uh, to do our uh, auditing. You can see uh, it's for uh, the next three years. Uh, cost uh, would be for uh, completing our audit at the end of this fiscal year, 16,000, uh, be $16,000 at the end of uh, 2022 and then uh, increase of $500 uh, when we get to 2023. Uh, and just so you know, uh, the 2021 of $16,000 is a $600 increase from last year. Questions? Okay, 5G, uh, we uh, is approve approval for the uh, proposed budget uh, for next uh, fiscal year and the whole entire packet of 5Gs in front of you, uh, the way Mr. Muscatella submits it and a summary. So Mr. Muscatella, anything you want to add to the discussion for the proposed budget for 21-22? So <clears throat> the budget that you have in front of you, uh, much of the budget, except for the first two pages, is the state's required format for public display of a proposed budget. So it's sort of convoluted. And so the reason why I gave you a summary page is so, I mean, you can sift through that packet if you'd like, uh, but the summary at the top. Um, so let me just go over that second page with you. So you understand, first of all, the budget and finance committee's recommendation as it stands today, and sort of give you a little bit of some additional commentary. The first is if you look at proposed revenues, uh, you'll see that uh, proposed revenues for 2021-22 are 18.358 million. Uh, you may be thinking change over prior year, 1.2 million. Okay, well let's let's go back a second to when we were setting this year's budget that we're in now. Uh, you'll you'll remember that we drastically reduced property tax collections and drastically reduced earned income tax collections. Uh, because we were just uncertain as to how COVID was going to affect uh, uh, property tax uh, payers' ability to pay, as well as unemployment's effect on earned income tax collections. So revenues over the, this year's budgeted year um, are significantly increased because what we know now um, is that one, uh, we had a, a, a pretty good property tax collection year. And number two, I can't even really explain it, but um, unemployment didn't really affect our earned income tax collections. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that I'm not unable to explain. So the reason why you see such a huge increase of, of revenues over prior year is because of that. Uh, that's unusual. And you won't see that from this year, from next year to the following year. Uh, maybe you see somewhere between 100 and 300,000, maybe as much as 400,000, depending on what the uh, what we do with property taxes and what we do with uh, and what the state does with their subsidies. <clears throat> Under proposed expenditures, uh, this is more in line. So um, we really didn't make any uh, drastic cuts to the expenditures 
for the current year that we're in. Uh, and there are no special things in next year's budget. So you see a normal increase in expenditures um, over prior year, 430,000. So proposed expenditures are 18.569 million. That does leave a deficit, a proposed deficit in, in this year's budget, or, I'm sorry, in, in for next year's budget of 210,748. Now I will preface that by saying there is a $50,000 budgetary reserve in there that up until this point, we have for illustration purposes pulled out. And I often get the question, what's budgetary reserve? Budgetary reserve, especially when you have a budget deficit, budgetary reserve is you saying, I'm gonna put $50,000 in fund balance into the budget to use for emergencies, unforeseen expenditures. Uh, if it's, uh, if you put a surplus, if you put a uh, budgetary reserve in a surplus budget, uh, a proposed surplus budget, then uh, you could have a lot of conversation about zeroing that out because it does, all you're doing is inflating your expenditures. So what we have is a, is a true deficit of 210,000. If for illustration purposes, you wanted to pull out the $50,000 in, in uh, budgetary reserve, uh, you're somewhere in the area of 160,000 uh, uh, of true deficit. Uh, and I, I wanna remind you that in this budget that you're looking at right now are $200,000 in federal revenue from for the COVID money, okay? So to note, okay, there are, if you look at that budget right there, that deficit, that's 210,000. If we yank out the $50,000 for budgetary reserve, but we also add back in or take away, I guess, the federal funds that we're including in the revenues, we have a truer deficit of closer to 360,000, okay? Because we are taking 200,000 of that and putting it into the revenues and not adding any additional expenditure. That is one-time revenue. So our truer deficit is closer to 360,000. With that being said, we have put together a, a programmatic way uh, uh, to, pull down these federal funds to help offset deficits over the course of the next three, potentially four years, depending on how the uh, grant narrative comes out or the grant uh, requirements come out for this next grant, uh, which we still have not seen the application for. Uh, so that will help us. But again, we have to make sure that we're showing true deficits so that we don't lose sight of that, okay? The following, all the following pages, just fall in line with what you're seeing in the summary page, okay? So I'm not gonna go through all of those pages. This is the Budget and Finance Committee's recommendation. This does not, and I wanna emphasize, does not include a property tax increase at all in this proposed budget. Uh, I think that the Budget and Finance Committee's uh, recommendation uh, was to, um, I think they need more time. I think the consensus was that they needed more time. Uh, this is, I would say, by no means a final budget. Um, the, the district has an opportunity, the Budget and Finance Committee and the board has an opportunity to make changes between now and the final budget that gets passed in June. And I think that uh, it, there is still a conversation to be had about property taxes, about federal funds, about expenditures, about all of those things. And I think that it would be too early or it'd be premature to include a property tax increase in this proposed budget. So this proposed budget does not include a property tax increase. Any questions? That's in the 8,000s. Yeah. Now, still there's $4,000 on the house. 4,000? 4,000. We're actually getting more than that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, over the years, yeah, we spread it out. We we could pull. It. So I think it's important to note um, when I say we want to be methodical about it, we don't want to pull it all down in the same year. Okay. So what we've done is we've we've looked at it over the course of three, potentially four years, and tried to pull down equal chunks over the course of those years to offset expenditures. Okay. But what I'm trying to point out is there is, is other monies coming. Yes. The yeah. the total. Other than what's on. Correct. You just put two hundred thousand. Correct. It's actually, more common. that's correct. Correct. Uh, and just for the record, too, I, uh, I've never um, 
I don't want to, I'm not trying to hide anything from the board. So what, I, what you need to know is that we are receiving over the course. So starting from March of last year through September of 2024, this district will receive in total approximately $3.9 million in federal funds. Uh, that was a handout at one point in time to the budget and finance committee. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly how much it is at this point, but we've already received um, several hundred thousand dollars of that already, if not a half a million or more. So we've already pulled that down and our, we're, we are currently offsetting expenditures today with that. And we offset some of it last year. Just to clarify that, Josh, the that 3.9 you just referenced, that was one-time monies, federal monies in relationship to the pandemic emergency funds. Yes, entirely. Okay. Yeah, and I should also clarify even further that to tell you that's probably from six or seven different federal grant sources. Um, you've probably heard on, on the news that, or in the newspaper for that matter, uh, that they Grants were the ones you've heard called the CARES Act funding, uh, the ESSERS 1, ESSERS 2, and ESSERS 3 funding. Those are the big ones, okay? We've also received, uh, I would say, significant dollars in other areas that were very, very targeted. Uh, for example, we received some special education funding that was very targeted. We received COVID-19 pandemic funding from FEMA that was used to offset pandemic-related expenditures. Uh, there were some other funds related to very specific things that we received, but the bulk of it is from what it's from the CARES Act, um, the, the, the huge trillion dollar packages that they rolled out over the course of the last year. Other questions regarding the proposed budget? Okay, so I just want to reiterate uh, that there will be a motion uh, on next week's agenda uh, to accept this as the proposed budget uh, for the next fiscal year. Um, and you can see, as he indicated, with a using fund balance of $210,748.26. Mr. Johnson, I just point out one other thing. So that use of, of fund balance is the largest use of fund balance that um, we have we have agreed in a proposed budget to use in this district in the last four years. It, it, it probably longer than that. It, it's not very common in this district to use a a, a deficit a, a fund balance of that amount. Okay, uh, I think we've had a historically we've had a policy here where we want to get it down to the to the budgetary reserve amount uh, of of fifty thousand uh, because running deficits uh, is is in my opinion is dangerous. Um, it's like running a deficit in your own checking account. You're eventually you're going to run out of money. So that is a fairly large deficit for this district at this point. So. Okay. Any other questions on that item? Okay. Seeing none, we will move along to five H. Uh, we're going to ask you to approve another online service for the following, uh, school year. And that's a renewal of PA ETEP uh, under EduLink Company. Um, and that is our electronic uh, teacher evaluation uh, that all teachers are in, along with our administrators uh, that uh, we use online. Uh, I am asking uh, for you to approve a three year agreement. And here's why. Uh, if you look under uh, the first PA ETEP, you'll see an annual fee of $22,876. That's what the annual fee would be if we went with a single year, asking you to go with approving a three-year agreement. Um, and with that, the total cost would be $10,691. That saves $814 uh, by doing a three-year agreement. At the same time, uh, that's holding that annual fee. So if I would ask you to approve that this year, again, the following year and the following year, that annual fee could increase. Uh, so what, by doing the three-year agreement, we're locking in the annual fee um, and also then uh, saving uh, $814 because by going with the multi-year, uh, they take off um, money down at the bottom. Questions? Okay. 
So any other uh, questions about budget and finance before we move out of that group? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move into buildings and grounds. Uh, <clears throat> two things, one, let me talk about one situation uh, before uh, we actually get into one that's listed there. Just wanna make you aware that <clears throat> Um, Mr. Dalton has identified uh, the new windows uh, replaced in the high school, which is 199 of them. Uh, nine of those windows uh, has a flaw to them or are developing flaw to them, uh, meaning that uh, there's a glaze on the outside of them that's supposed to be heat help heat resistance. And what's happening is it's like someone threw, if you would look at it, it looks like someone from the outside threw mud up against that glass and it's stuck. However, it's not mud, okay? Uh, it's actually uh, in that glass surface. Uh, so uh, Mr. Dalton is working uh, with the McClure company uh, to uh, get a remedy to it. Um, Nittany uh, Window uh, Company will be out uh, looking at those. Uh, so I just wanna make you aware uh, that that's happened to nine windows. Uh, we do have warranty uh, that on those windows. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that you are aware and we'll keep you updated as to what's going to happen there. Questions on that? The, all the windows that were replaced were on primarily what building and what location? And second is, are these windows sort of clustered and grouped together or are they random throughout the replacement? So all high school windows uh, were replaced uh, when we went through the ESCO project. Uh, so it's 199 of them. Um, Mr. Dalton, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Johnston. Those nine windows, are they in different locations? Are they all in the, pretty much the same location at the high school? They are sporadic throughout the building. There's nothing that is, uh, would indicate they were all manufactured at the same time. Okay, I, I just wanted to know that if it was a particular location of a grouping of windows, if they get a lot of sun or if it's a random thing, just to determine if this is going to be an ongoing problem. Right. And I don't know what length of warranty time period we have. 10 um, years. 10? Yep. Okay. So I guess just. And we're in year two of 10. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have some time if it gets to that point of the mm -hmm. remedy of a replacement. Yes. It should be taken care of. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Anything else you wanted to add to that item, Mr. Dalton, before I move on? No. Um, like I said, they're just sporadic. Uh, there's a couple in the junior high wing, a couple in the cafeteria. There, there's one in the uh, senior high wing, and then there's a couple along the back by the industrial arts room. So there's nothing um, that's showing up right now to show a pattern. They're saying it's a um, possible defect in the glazing process right now. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, and then we have listed fitness center uh, units. If you wanna take a look, uh, if you're online, I just added that uh, this afternoon uh, online. And if you are seated here, it was off to the side of your stack. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about fitness center mounted unit events. Uh, there are two of them in the fitness center. Uh, the one towards the front entrance uh, is not heating or cooling. Uh, it's just basically circulate, circulating air. Uh, the second unit uh, towards the back uh, is heating uh, and is somewhat cooling, uh, but we have a leak uh, on that back unit also. So <clears throat> Mr. Dalton has uh, contacted uh, <clears throat> Havtech, uh, which you see on that handout uh, to repair uh, those units. And both of those units are in the ceiling. Uh, to repair those uh, would be a cost of $12,000. Now, when we repair those units, uh, there will be no warranty. The warranty has expired on those units. Uh, those units are 18 years old. Uh, they're currently there. Uh, to repair those uh, it would be $12,000. Uh, so because it was $12,000 and uh, there was no warranty, uh, Mr. Dalton had asked uh, Havtech to uh, give a recommendation for different units. Um, and those different units, uh, lack of a better term for me to describe, I'll call them mini split heat pumps. Um, and they are uh, quoting uh, for them 
uh, to install those. So in other words, we would abandon uh, the two units that are there uh, and we would install uh, the uh, mini split heat pumps cost from Havtech uh, quoted $19,375. So Mr. Dalton and I, along with Mr. Muscatello had some discussion. Uh, Mr. Dalton then went to Penn Stan and said, hey, could you uh, get us three quotes from three local contractors? And uh, they, Penn Stan did provide that to Mr. Dalton. And you can see that they're listed there, uh, JL Dum. Uh, so these split, mini split heat pumps that have tech um, is saying their quote is 19,375. Three locals uh, say they can do the exact same thing. Um, and you can see JL Dum at 10,000. Brink Plumbing and Heating, $8,627.20. Tulick Valley HVAC, $7,336.14. So with that said, <clears throat> by putting those units in, uh, those units would then have a 10-year warranty, uh, five-year on electrical, and then one year on labor. So Mr. Dalton, anything you want to add? Did I describe everything accurately? I think you pretty much... Uh described it just the way we discussed it. So um, I'm thinking our best investment is to uh, install the Samsung mini splits with uh, the lowest bid quote, so to speak. Um, I, I'm confident they will do the job that we need down there. Actually, probably even better than what we are accustomed to with the other two univents that are running now. Questions from anyone? Oh, no. So, uh, Mr. Dalton, well, two things. One, if you chose to, we're, we're at a line uh, with Mr. Dalton's budget. So, if we would put the new units in, he does have the money in his operating budget uh, for the $7,336.14. If we would uh, want to uh, repair those units, uh, that uh, have tech said uh, that they would do, but with no warranty getting to 12,000, then we would have to go to capital reserve. So uh, Mr. Dalton's recommendation, lowest bid out of his general operating budget. No, nope. That total cost of 7,336.14 would come out of his. Okay, what about the that's that's just have text quote for the same thing. Yes. Yep. 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 When when would that take place then? When are you thinking to have that completed, Mr. Dalton? Because I know um, summer gets hot. Pending uh, approval next week, I would expect to have that uh, in and up and running by the first of June. Okay, thank you. Are we taking out the other units? I mean, we're not replacing unit with unit. Is that correct? We're that's correct. Different types. The many splits different. Than, is are they on the roof now? Is that uh... no? They're the unit vents are mounted just under the ceiling inside the building. Uh, my thought is right now we're just going to shut them off and leave them in place and mount these other units uh, beside them. Okay. And then um, once we um, have time and that, we'll look at uh, pulling them out of there. Thank you, Mark. Other questions? Okay. Any other items under buildings and grounds? Okay. Moving along to athletics. Uh, approval of sports volunteer. We had a request from our softball coach uh, to approve Larkin Crow as a volunteer for softball. Um, any questions on that one? Okay. Next, uh, 7B, a uh, request uh, from Coach Packer uh, to have football camp approved at Seth Mack. Uh, that would run from August 15th to August 20th. Questions, comments? 
Okay. Anything else under athletics? Seeing none, we'll move along. Transportation, uh, we'll have three drivers uh, to approve for yet this school year. Uh, public relations, nothing under there at this time. Moving to number 10, policies. Uh, approve admin reg AR109, weeding of resource materials. If you would take a look at that handout, uh, either online or in front of you. Uh, so <clears throat> we have not had this admin reg in place. Um, and this is related to any of our resource materials. And to be quite honest, it come up uh, in an admin meeting uh, when we're talking about technology, but then we have more discussion and we always keep and store items. Uh, so uh, what we're wanting to do uh, is for you to approve an admin reg um, that allows us to weed out materials that we don't need, uh, that we find that are not have any value or use uh, to us uh, within a certain time frame. Uh, so let me take you clear to the bottom for that statement. Uh, so anything uh, that we would look at removing, uh, which is looking at reasons one through seven, what we're wanting to do is if we identify any items, uh, we would want to uh, be able to give those to either a staff member, graduating seniors, or donating to public libraries or nonprofits. Uh, so you, you may be saying, well, why did this come up? So uh, Mr. Gramling uh, had indicated back some time ago uh, that we had to go through a process with our Chromebooks, uh, meaning that uh, we were there are certain grade levels uh, that we're going to purchase Chromebooks, and the life of those Chromebooks are basically uh, four years, to be quite honest. Um, and he can, you can certainly question him away here in a moment. Um, and so what we're wanting to do um, as uh, though every ninth grader will be given a new one um, and that'll progress through uh, with that particular student. And so by the time uh, that Chromebook is four years old, uh, we're wanting to give those Chromebooks to the seniors um, as they go. Uh, and you may say, well, <clears throat> why don't we just keep them? Uh, he'll explain to you how they uh, don't uh, keep up with what we need to do. And in turn, you've heard us before, as we have technology polyps around here, then we're trying to get rid of it. Um, uh, so particularly, this whole weeding of resources come up based on that. But in turn, I'm not just wanting to look at uh, technology uh, items uh, so that if if we have a series of textbook, uh, then we purchase a new textbook and it's in storage and that type of thing. Uh, just see no absolute use of keeping that stuff and stuff and stuff uh, that we do have around here. Uh, so that's the admin regulation. Mr. Grambling, I don't know if you wanna add anything particularly uh, to when it comes to the technology side, because honestly, that's how our admin conversation got sparked uh, was the idea of uh, Chromebooks. <clears throat> So, but having that extra grade, we're kind of just looking at 
Questions? Just one question I have as far as the Crown Books, we, we made that initial move based on this past year and, and every student got a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. And I think th there was no issue with that with each student. I guess moving forward as we start to get back into a, a normalcy, is it still intended to have every student yes. have a Chromebook? Absolutely. Okay. So every student will continue to have a Chromebook. So Dave, just go ahead and 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 Dave budgets for this, uh, what's coming up. So go ahead and go through the each grade and then how long that'll last and the next time you'll purchase new. Yeah, so every year we'll be uh, looking to purchase new Chromebooks for kindergarten, fifth grade. So I look at the enrollment and based on the numbers that we have purchased, we actually uh, Okay, so I, I know when we talked about this initially, and we had monitoring systems in place to see usage and things like that, uh, what site, we even had some protection software for what site availability and everything like that. Um, have we seen effective use, or have we seen sporadic use, or if we, you know, what have we seen? Uh, every student is using their Chromebook at, at least at some point, and I, I make that point because there is lower grades that don't use it much, but in high school, it would be rare that they're not holding on. Okay. Okay, I, I just want to make, you know, because as we talk mm -hmm. about these purchases, sometimes the vigor of that gets sure. lost over time and, and you know some of the experience that i've seen with my own kids i mean they're on them all the time mm -hmm. um so that that's that's a good thing right. and i think it gets them used to yep. what what this day and age is, is sure. giving us no and we've had that discussion at the admin level uh that uh we will continue uh with google classroom um and teachers are putting their lesson plans in there and that type of thing uh, so yes, we will continue with that. Um, in fact, we have to continue with that uh, because uh, part of our uh, process for applying for the five flexible instruction days, they want to know, well, well, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and and I'm clearly putting in there that each student's uh, equipped with a Chromebook um, and that uh, uh, we will continue basically operating like we have this year on those five days if we have to use them. Can I add something? I, I, I think that, that sure. Go ahead. Go I just ahead. wanted. I just wanted to say at the secondary level, it's worked out very well, um, especially with our lack of subs. So if a teacher knows they're going to be out, they can put lesson plans or they can put activities on Google Classroom. And even if I have to, I have to be in the auditorium with two or three different classes. They're not missing their instruction. The assignments are on their Google are, are their Google Classroom pages. Everybody has a Chromebook. They log in and they just do the assignment, uh, regardless of if they're in the classroom with a substitute or they're in the auditorium with me because I don't have a sub. That, that's that's a good point because I that was sort mm -hmm. of some of the things that you know we we can take as a positive from what sure. we've seen the usage of. that's why I asked the question so I appreciate that thank you other questions or comments about uh, the weeding of resource materials okay, so a student going through a Correct. Yes. Yep. What happens to the other? Well, he he has learners. You want to talk about that? <laughs> he doesn't like to talk about the learners, but go ahead. <laughs> So if they just forgot their Chromebook, got the charger, take it to 
born a criminal, you know, it's been prepared. Is that you are issued the Chromebook and it's polished in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Um, you are issued the Chromebook in fifth grade, polished in sixth, polished in seventh, polished in eighth, and so on. So, um, you know, if you did something to your Chromebook when you were in fifth grade, you could do your Chromebook. Sure. Will Will textbooks be going virtual or whatever? Is that what's going to happen? I, to I, I think you will find more and more that will go that direction. Yeah. And so, honestly, when you uh, approve that admin reg, uh, it is our plan uh, that this year's senior class uh, would be the first to get uh, to keep theirs. Am I correct, Mr. Gramling? Any other questions? Okay, nothing under correspondence. New business, uh, 12A. Uh, it's that time of year that we need to appoint board secretary. Mr. Muscatello served in that capacity. Uh, we would uh, uh, recommend, well, I guess you can decide that, but we'd recommend that uh, we would have Mr. Muscatello appointed again as uh, board secretary. Uh, Mrs. Peterson serves as the assistant, 12B. Um, so we would have motions for approval next year or next week again for next year. Comments, questions on either. I just have one comment. I think uh, we used to do this every four, well, I know for a fact we have to do this every four years and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So if anybody wants to be board secretary, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying if you, anybody wants, to, okay. <laughs> Okay, moving on to 12C, summer salaries. We do have two additional requests, Mrs. Lauer and Mr. Hughes, uh, for summer salary. So there'll be a motion next week. 12D, yearbook proposals. Uh, so we're giving uh, Mrs. Sabatini, our yearbook advisor, a little bit of time. Uh, if she can make a firm decision uh, with us by uh, next Tuesday when you get your board agenda, uh, you could see uh, us going with either Life Touch, uh, which is the photography group that was just approved. Uh, or approving agreement again with Jostens, uh, who we've been with for a few years. Uh, so um, Life Touch uh, come in uh, with a honestly a fabulous proposal uh, to be the school photographer. Uh, honestly, uh, they're coming in again with uh, a pretty good proposal, in my opinion, uh, to do the yearbook. Um, in turn, uh, we're having discussion with Jostin, so uh, we're letting Mrs. Sabatini take a little bit of time to review that, and again, if we can come to that conclusion uh, by next Tuesday, when you get your board agenda, we'll have one of the two on there. And if she doesn't feel comfortable, uh, we'll do it the following month. Questions? Okay, next, uh, approved substitute uh, yet for this year. Uh, we do have one listed for approval for next week. Uh, next, 12F, approve summer programs. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple new things uh, this summer, or we would like to, uh, so we would like your approval. And Mrs. Zeglin, can you hear me? Uh, Mrs. Zeglin is going to talk about a uh, new program uh, at the elementary uh, that we would like to do this summer. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. Uh, I just want to follow up with Mr. Muscatella earlier this evening. He was talking about the ESSER funds, and part of those funds is the ESSER three funds, and this is a or should be used for specifically targeting the learning loss due to the school closures and also the COVID. So, you know, one of the things that we were talking about as an admin team was to create summer programs that would um, get our students into the buildings over the summertime and we would target um, academics and also, you know, fun activities and, and extracurriculars for them. The last couple of weeks, the elementary, we have been very busy trying to plan two two-week summer sessions 
Our plan is to begin um, on Monday, June 21st for two weeks. And then the second session will begin on Monday, August 2nd. Um, the programs will run Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, now we are currently still working out some of the details of that, actually what those days will look like. Um, but I can tell you that every day will be filled with reading, math, physical activities, uh, STEAM experiments, and also other fun activities. Actually today I did book the Carnegie Science Center Fab Lab to come to Pennsylvania Elementary for July 1st. So I'm looking forward to that. We really want to build in a lot of incentives um, for the students to want to be there. So, you know, just so that you know that that, you know, we are working on um, that and trying to find those activities, um, little um, just incentives for them to come. Um, also, transportation and lunch will also be provided for free of charge. Um, and as soon as we iron out some of the fine details, I will be sending home sign up sheets and information, um, like I said, as soon as I finalize those details. Um, I can tell you though, I have a lot of support at the elementary level. I have a lot of teachers who are very interested and wanna be a part of this. Um, I have at least four or five IAs who also wanna be a part of it. So it's, it's a very positive thing and um, we're looking forward to getting this into fruition. Are there any questions? I just have one, Mrs. Zeglin, that um, sure. I guess do we have a cutoff as far as an, uh, participation or is it uh, for all in the uh, primary? You know what, it's for all um, pre-K. We're working on something special for pre-K because believe it or not, the pre-K does not fit underneath the, that umbrella for the, the K to 12 funds. So we're working on something special for um, the, our four-year-olds coming into the district. So any student K to five um, is eligible and we want them to come. So I'm, I'm not gonna turn anybody away and, I, and I'm never gonna say it's filled. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do wanna just take time while Mrs. Zeglin is here and, it, and it's working out well in what uh, she's planning to do. Um, the, I just want to remind everyone that the, co, the funding uh, for the Evergreen uh, Club uh, did not uh, carry over uh, for this year, um, and the state was, has not released application uh, for the IU to apply uh, for the club uh, to take place here and at United. Uh, so we will not be having uh, the uh, Evergreen Club uh, this summer, uh, so it is uh, a nice program. Uh, that uh, we're planning uh, in place. Uh, and now it won't fill up as many weeks as Evergreen has in the past, uh, but uh, it will uh, fulfill some of those needs. You know, and I have to tell you as well, um, I had asked the teachers, whoever they were interested, we all met yesterday morning and, and I said to them, I said, I need some help. You know, I, I need some help with this planning. I, I wanna come up with how many days for how long. And I was originally thinking one week in June and one week in August. Um, and it was actually the teachers that said, Mrs. Eglin, that's not enough. Let's do two weeks in June, you know, funds are available and, and they are. Let's do the two weeks in June and two weeks in August. So, you know, it, it's really coming from them that, that they want to do this. And, you know, it, it's, we can't have four or five hours a day in the summertime, you know, just working on reading and math. So we, we do want to add in those fun activities and the exploratory learning, especially. Um, we all know last year, the one thing that was taken away from them was that social interaction, the social emotional learning. Those, those are, are, are our key areas and our focus areas as well. We, just, we want them to be kids. Um, but at the same time, we know that, that we also want to um, enhance the academic piece. So just so that you all know that that's where our focus is. And, and I want the kids to be kids. I want them to explore. I want them to, you know, make new friends. And, and at the same time, we are going to target the, the reading and math. So um, I thank you for your support on that. 
question. Yeah, just one other question. I I don't know if this has been a consideration or not, but is it an opportunity to reach out to neighboring schools and use this as a potential PR uh, opportunity um, to to see if if they don't have something similar for their students? There's that opportunity, as like we had talked of before. Um, if if that, I don't know if that something like that exists for for a summertime sure. program. Sure, yeah. we could we could have the conversations. I guess I would just have to go back or ask Mr. Muscatelli. We go back and see uh, with this particular funding um, if we're allowed to do that. I mean, if we are, I don't have a problem. Having well, well, I mean, I, I guess I would preface that that you know that funding is for our students at this mm-hmm. school. But if reaching out, that offering can be there. But there's 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 a, a fee that goes with that. Yeah. Sure. So I, I don't know mm-hmm. something to think about. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. We could we could check with contracted services and those federal grants because that's what that would be. Uh, but every school has to spend twenty percent of that third grant. For us, it's four hundred and sixty thousand dollars on learning loss over the next three True. to four years. I mean, you're correct. So. In other words, Mrs. Eglin gets a count as to how many we have. If we can offer out another district, the other district could use their funds uh, to pay towards. Sure. Because I think if there's an opportunity for involvement and folks want to be involved with it, I can tell you that talking some to some parents of school uh, children in other school districts, mm-hmm. uh, there's somewhat envy of us uh, of how we proceeded with uh, mm-hmm. the pandemic. Sure. And, and that. So I, I think these are some maybe some good things. I mean, we can take care of our own, but you sure. know, have an outreach that maybe could could help well, us. We'll have that discussion. Yeah, and Anything I else, Mrs. Eglin? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I do want to have one more thing um, conversation. I, I reached out today to our Indiana County Head Start. Um, you know, as I had mentioned, <clears throat> this grant really does target the five you know, age five and up. Um, And, you know, as we're looking at our numbers and perhaps some of our needs of our pre-K kids for next year, um, I reached out to Head Start today and and I was just asking them, you know, what they're planning to do because they are receiving some of these funds as well. And and I offered Penn's Manor, you know, if if we could even extend the co-op that we already have. um, And if they're planning on doing anything this summer, you know, if we can help, um, you know, target for our own students. And they were both so very appreciative. And, and they, both of the, the coordinators said, you know, Kristen, you know, it's Penn's Manor is the only school district that we have this kind of relationship with. And, um, and they said, and we know that Penn's Manor is here for the kids. And, you know, it, it, and I was very appreciative of that. And, and we are noticed. And I just want to say that, that we are definitely noticed and, and, and they wish because, you know, Indiana Head Start services all of the districts, um, but they were very appreciative and, and I'm hoping to, to increase that relationship with that agency because they do so many good things for our, our kids as well. Okay. Kristen, does... Uh... Head Start, is it a year-round program or just follow the school year? I, I don't know. It follows the school year. Um, and I was hoping today, whenever I reached out, that they would say, hey, we got some funds as well. And this is, you know, these are some things that we're planning to do this summer. Um, they are not quite there yet. Um, they have their meeting tomorrow. And, and that's why I said, I said, well, when you're at your meeting, you know, please do keep us in mind. Um, and if there's anything that we can do, you know, offering the buildings, offering some more support, um, if you want me to come to you, you guys come to us, whatever, you know, whatever it is that, that we can do. Um, they were hit pretty hard with the pandemic. They did not go to school um, five days a week. They were two days on and, you know, one day virtual here or there. And unfortunately, we're talking about four-year-olds. So they, their participation virtually was not as high as ours. Um, so, you know, that is a concern as well, because they do service, you know, our students as three-year-olds as well. Um, so they just did not get that, that crucial early inter- interventions um, that they would have received in previous years. So that's a concern of mine as well as to what needs um, our, our students will need as they come into our school. 
So um, again, I'm just keeping that open line of communication with them um, just to make sure that, like I said, our families and our students are getting the support that they need. Thank you. Joshua, is the, the funding, uh, uh, Mrs. Zeglin mentioned is kindergarten and up? Is that the, the case of five? Well, it, it's important to note that while this particular grant may not specifically say that, the, the pre-K program is specifically funded by separate grant dollars. So while I don't think, and I haven't talked to Mrs. Zeglin about this, but I, I would think that if we provided a program uh, for K through five and pre-K happened to be there, I'm not 100% sure that would be an issue. It's just that we won't get any additional pre-K funding for a program like this. Right. And I was just and having pre-K's for you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just having four years old. about using the two different funds, funding sources, you know, and I did reach out to Mr. 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 Josh um, and he and I just did not have a chance to, to to meet up today, but um, we will definitely consider those and continue that conversation. You know, you mentioned three-year-olds too, and, and I know that, but any intervention that could help is going to help us and help our students once they get here. If, if you know, they uh, had issues over the last year, 18 months, uh, we're going to fill those down the line, aren't we? Yes, absolutely. Let's see what you can do to make uh, whatever. Other questions for elementary program? Anything else you want to add, Mrs. Zeglin? Nope, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then also, uh, we wanted to start something uh, new for this summer. Uh, Mrs. Dolges, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You want to go ahead and talk about uh, what we're thinking high school wise? Um, yes, one of our concerns at the secondary level is we've we've been struggling with some students um, in and out with Google Classroom. Uh, for a, major a majority of the students on Google Classroom uh, worked hard, did well, um, but we have some students out there who went to Google Classroom, uh, didn't do a whole lot, and then when they came back, the grades were low. Um, so our senior class in particular. We have about five or six kids who right now are in jeopardy of not walking at graduation because they are not passing some of their courses. Um, and when you have a graduating class of 50, 55, 60 students, five or six students is, you know, t at least 10% of your graduating class. Um, our concern as administration is that's going to affect our graduation rate. Um, for the district uh, and that could, you know, we could be looking at possibly an improvement plan or corrective action or something along those lines because of the dip in our graduation rate. So what we were looking at with some of our funding is offering um, the kids every year have an option to do credit recovery. We use two different credit recovery programs. We use one called Keystone Credit Recovery and another one called Edgeseer. Um, the students are responsible to pay for the courses and the courses range from $119 to $200 per course. And every year students have the opportunity to take two credits in summer school to recover the credit. Um, our idea this year was to offer the seniors um, using some of the money, offer the seniors the opportunity. Uh, we would cover the cost of the credit recovery course, um, but they would have to come into the building to um, to complete the course, if we're going to pay for it, they would have to come into the building to complete the course and we would have a certified teacher in the building working with them um, to get the course completed. Uh, so we had budgeted a three week period where the um, teacher would come in uh, and work with the kids up for th up to three weeks from nine o'clock to two o'clock. Um, they would have the option, they could do the other options and pay for it themselves if they didn't want to come in. But um, to try to help ensure that the students pass the courses, we'd like to have them come in and work with the staff. I do just want to add that, uh, I'll go ahead, Mrs. Dolge. Sorry. I was going to say, you know, in this option with us covering the cost of the course was only going to be uh, available to the seniors for now. And the reason we had that conversation is want to reiterate that, uh, 
graduation rate. Uh, we must look at that all the time. Uh, so just imagine six seniors uh, in a class of 63. Um, and I will have to say to say, and Mrs. Dolges knows this too, uh, that, okay, in the past we've had one or two. Uh, we just have not had this many in one class. Uh, she's explained to you what we feel are some of the reasons that took place or happened. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, help and assist in correcting that, uh, but they've got to come and meet us at the plate, so to speak. Uh, that count graduation, uh, we have to take care of that over the summer uh, because by October 1st, uh, we submit all of our counts uh, into PIMS. And then after October 1, uh, graduation rate from the previous year uh, gets so-called put into the record into the books. Uh, so we've got to re uh, remediate those students. Uh, we have that period of time. And again, by October 1st is the very last day uh, that we can put our uh, information into the system. This is Dolgis. Well, yes. you said two, two, cl two classes basically is what two credits. How, how did you say that? And how will that affect those five or six? Will they be able to graduate then from Penn's Manor in this year? Yes. So the, or, so when you look at the, most of the kids who we're looking at, um, they're failing one or two core subjects. Um, if they fail, they have to have 24 credits. And so they have to have the four math, four science, four English, um, four history. And so a lot of these kids are failing one or two of their core academic classes. The electives they're able to pull through, um, but it's the core work. And we had a number of students who already felt they were so far behind that they quit working. They thought, you know, it's not worth me trying if I'm not going to be able to, you know, pass the course. Um, we've had, we've sent registered letters to all the students who are in danger of failing. We've had parent meetings. Um, the guidance counselors, I give them a ton of credit because they are constantly reaching out to to those parents of the students who are in danger of failing. Um, we've had them in, we've met with them, and it's just been an ongoing struggle. Um, but sometimes, you know, some of these kids, like the one parent said, he's 18 years old, you know, we can only do so much with them. He's got to, he's got to do his part. Um, so we're hoping that if we offer a credit recovery where if you come in and if it takes them one week or two weeks to finish the course, then that's all the longer they need to come in. Um, but we were thinking to have it up to a three week from Monday through Thursday from nine to two, um, have them come in and work with a certified teacher um, just to help ensure that they can get through the course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Dolges. Uh, moving along under new business, uh, 12G uh, approval renewal contract uh, with METS. Uh, Mr. Muscatello, anything you wanna add to that? Uh, I would just say that um, we've been using METS now for, well, 10 years at least, I'd say. Um, we've had multiple managers over those years. Um, and what we've done with the METS program, so METS doesn't operate, they are not our frontline workers. Our frontline workers are Penn's Manor employees, but we have a cafeteria manager and the entire METS team behind that, that does the supervising and managing. Um, and the supervising of the staff is one thing, but it's the menu planning, the food ordering, um, you know, making sure that the dietitian gets involved to make sure that the, the food is, is served according to state standards. And believe me, there are plenty of state standards. Uh, we also have to follow federal standards because we, we bring down federal funds and state funds for our, our cafeteria. So that's a very complicated process, uh, but we've been using uh, METS for a long time now. Uh, probably the biggest benefit in addition to having their um, their employees on, on the job is that they're buying power. So one school buying from U.S. Foods is one school, but they have multiple schools. All of their clients buy from the same source. So our food costs are considerably lower as a result of that. Do you want to talk about in the process of renewing their contract about where they're quoting in as the loss? Oh, yes. So over the years, uh, let me just quickly tell you how food contracts work in in the state of Pennsylvania. So they're fi they can be their five year contracts, the base year is bid. So we did that three years ago. Um, the base year is bid and you have four one year options. Uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, when you have a uh, contract for food service, uh, one of the ways you can have a contract for food service is 
is on what's called a, um, a cost reimbursable contract, uh, and which is what we have here. Uh, so the whole contract is like 60 pages or, or more long. It's very, it's very complicated and, 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 and really actually convoluted, if you ask me, where you, re you report all of your projected costs for a particular school year. And they are just that projected costs. There's the revenue side. There's how many meals you plan to sell, how many you know, breakfast, lunch, special catering, the whole nine yards. You've got federal, you know, and then you have all the expenditure size. And then, and then you have a, basically a profit loss. Uh, so we take all of that and the loss at the end can be guaranteed. Okay. In some school districts where cafeteria is popular, uh, I'll use Indiana as an example, their cafeteria contracts, their vendor is guaranteeing them a certain profit on their cafeteria. Okay. Here they guarantee our loss because we just don't have enough support in our cafeteria, uh, enough revenue generating in our cafeteria to, um, to guarantee even to break even. So over the years, they have guaranteed a smaller and smaller loss that's coincided with a reduction in hours in cafeteria, uh, as well as some other efficiencies that we've, we've sought throughout the years. Uh, and the loss is now down to 185,000 that they're willing to guarantee. I will tell you that they were higher than that in their initial proposal. Push back, tell them that they need to do some uh, bigger and better things to improve participation, bring costs down, so on and so forth. And I think that goes hand in hand with the next thing that's on the agenda. But before we move on to that, do you have any, I know I went over that fast, I apologize. Do you have any questions specific to food service contracts? Well, how do we get to the positive? What, what do we need to do? What do they need to do? Uh, and. I just don't understand the loss when everybody gets free lunches because of COVID. Sure, right? yeah, sure. So that's a, that's an excellent point. Um, and so I, I had this conversation with them. Uh, there's really two. There's only well, there's not really. There's only two ways to improve uh, the or, or or shorten smaller, make the loss smaller. You improve participation, so more kids eat. Uh, or you reduce expenditures, or both, obviously. Um, what we have seen is participation has been stagnant um, over the last so many years. For, for a long time, it's basically been stagnant or, or, or declining. Um, if we were to go back to, I forget what year that was that I shared with you, 2006 maybe, even maybe older than that, 2009 maybe. Uh, 2009 participation was, uh, it was in the 80s. OK, kids were eating the food here uh, quite regularly. Uh, and when you look at those years, you also find out the losses were even greater. Now, why is that? The losses, kids were eating, but our expenditures were that much higher. OK, we had a, 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 a much larger uh, staff. Sorry, not larger staff. We had more hours in our kitchen. So we had more eight hour employees back then. That's number one. Number two, uh, the, we, we were making meals in different ways. Okay, we were hand making more meals, they were, more, they were more costly to make, so on and so forth. So we found out that our losses were actually larger back then. So fast forward to today, not 100% sure when, when these went into place, but you, you may remember that, there, that Michelle Obama pushed a brand new um, diet for kids uh, in schools. And so the meals really changed quite a bit. The meal, the meal structures changed. Um, and you know, the cost of food came down because it's all prepackaged food, not, not all of it, some of it's still made from scratch. Uh, but what we haven't seen is an increase in participation. Uh, and so initially when they proposed to us uh, a, 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 a smaller loss, guaranteeing a smaller loss, I said to them, guys, this isn't gonna work. We need to find ways to increase the revenue in this cafeteria. And so they proposed to me five ways that we can uh, increase revenue in the cafeteria, increase participation in the cafeteria. Uh, and after I read those five things, I looked up at them and I said, why aren't we already doing these five things? Because uh, they were obvious five things. You know, they were things that were just obvious to me. So uh, they've started to implement all five of those things today, not to wait until the renewal year, but they've already started to implement those things. But their point is, and it's actually a good point, the things that they're going to do are only going to increase the satisfaction of the cafeteria with those who already eat. Okay, we can't force kids to eat. Um, if you if you've been packing your lunch since fifth grade, you're probably packing your lunch in tenth grade. You've just 
you just pack your lunch. Um, your mom packs your lunch, parents pack your lunch, whatever it might be. Uh, our participation is higher in the elementary school, lower in the high school. It's just what it is. Um, so we can try lots of different things, but what we have found is you just increase the satisfaction of those who are eating. And even though it is free, it is 100% free, we have not seen participation go up, even though it is 100% free. As a matter of fact, participation has gone down a little bit. Now, breakfast participation is through the roof. We've taken the breakfast and we put it in the hallway and now they walk past and they grab a breakfast. Now that's through the roof. That is the, the participation we're seeing there we've never seen. Um, but lunch participation is lackluster. One, one point that I just want to bring up on that is you talked about, you know, maybe, maybe the quality of the meal and, and the participation and it goes along with the cost. I guess if there are folks that do pack their lunch, I can recall my kids, they were moving through, there were certain dishes. They normally pack their lunch, but when it was that day, they bought. Sure. So I don't know if they're just moving so far away from maybe those really good meals that really pull in some participation to start to offset that. Maybe that's a change in menu that you, you know, and I don't know if that was one of the things they proposed, but I think just those kind of things uh, can maybe start to sway and see a little bit of a difference because to continue operate a loss, it, you know, you just, you, you wonder, you know. Sure. Uh, and I think it's important to note that school districts as a whole operate as loss. Okay. We, we only focus in on the cafeteria because we treat it as a separate entity, as a business entity. And when we present it to you, we present it to you as a profit over loss. Okay. So it's important to note that, you know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say, we have an obligation to feed kids, right? Uh, we do so at a loss. We do so, we would do it for a profit. We would do it for a loss. Uh, and so when we look at how do we increase participation? How do we look, you know, what, what do we take off the menu? What do we put on the menu? So one of the five things that they suggested was a dining survey um, to find out uh, what, why do kids eat at certain times? What do they like? So on and so forth. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, we were serving pizza a couple of days a week. Um, and I, but I said to the cafeteria manager at the time, I said, just serve it every day. Um, because kids like pizza. And if it's that popular, if they're eating, if, if they're eating pizza on Tuesdays and Thursdays, then maybe you catch a couple of kids who don't eat on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you catch them with pizza on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So a couple of years ago, they've implemented pizza every day in the high school. Um, I think that's been relatively popular. Uh, and they've introduced additional pizza days in, in the elementary school. But eating pizza every day. Is that really what we want? You know, I mean, is that what we want? So we're balancing popularity with, a, you know, a healthy meal and a healthy meal is a, is a slice of pizza. That's what the federal standards say. It is a, it is a healthy meal. Um, and so they've also suggested some additional things like Mexican bars, um, pasta bars, different things that, you know, we're not necessarily doing today that they could be doing to which I said to them, if I need to spend a dollar to get $2 back, I want to know those things. I want to be able to do those things. Uh, if, so, so they're, they're looking at some, some ways that we can spend maybe additional money that will have a larger return on investment. And we'll be talking about those at some point too. Additional questions regarding contract renewal with METS. Okay. Moving along, uh, next item 12 H, um, motion to accept a resignation of Beth Kokla as cafeteria worker. And um, that's effective at the end of the fiscal year. Um, and it is a recommendation uh, from um, our METS uh, food director um, that that position uh, would be uh, four and a half hours uh, beginning next year. Uh, so that would be a de decrease. Uh, uh, Ms. Kokla, Mrs. Kokla uh, will, uh, is an eight hour employee um, and will replace uh, that position with a four and a half hour position. Questions? Next, uh, moving along to 12I, uh, you'll see a packet uh, or attached online or in front of you, uh, approval agreement with Adelphi uh, for behavioral support. There's three programs, day treatment and uh, the YES program. Uh, you'll see listed in there. Uh, and again, just to remind everyone, uh, that that's an alternative placement for students. Uh, and you approve all of those uh, as a board. 
uh, we bring them to you. Uh, so if we're placing someone in the YES program or the behavioral support, uh, it's $92.15 for a regular ed student, uh, $101.44 for a special ed student. Uh, if we place someone in their day treatment program, it's $132.92. If it's a special ed student, $138.99. Questions? Okay, uh, moving along to 12J. Uh, Cherry Hill Township uh, Volunteer Fire Company uh, has sent to us um, their uh, letter uh, indicating their drive, their fund drive. Uh, it was actually sent here to the district. Uh, we are in Cherry Hill Township. Um, I would assume that's why it was sent to us. Uh, so uh, didn't know if there was any interest in looking at that and giving a donation uh, because that's basically what the drive's for. Any discussion, comments, anything you want to do? We have not. Is this who? Is this who would come? Is Cherry Hill would be? Cherry Hill folks? would be their first responder. Yes, but you can see as evidence of what took place in Indiana School District. Unfortunately, uh, when you have a, anything that's major, you're going to pull from all kinds of companies oh yes absolutely they and they they would be the first ones here and they would be the first commanding uh giving the orders for all the rest yeah yep they come up uh, with elementary um and that's been shared uh between uh cherry hill township and pine uh and so describing you know, someone will come up with a fire engine, have the whole discussion presentation at the elementary level. Yes. Yes. No, yep, yeah, they do that on their own. I would agree with Ron and also though my question is going to be even though there are first responders and you said that they work with connection in conjunction with pine sometimes with the sure okay so pine and climber also if we had something happen here they would probably come too so what I'm asking is if we give something to Cherry Hill probably the next thing we're going to you know if if pine and climber ask we can't really tell them no can we I mean, even though Cherry Hills are first responders, like I said, if something major would happen here, all sure. three of them would be here. Mm -hmm. That's just a question yep. I had because I can see that happening. Sure. Yep. What's your thoughts? I agree with you, but where would it stop? Because I'm excited for it to come somewhere. Right. But the only thing different, I think, and my point is, the, the kids from Pine and Climber come to Penn's Manor. So that's the only reason why I would distinguish those. If you want to make a donation, any suggestions of? Where, where would what? it come from there? Uh, we do, we budget for public relations. Uh, do we hardly ever use it in the budget? No. Whatever we anything that comes in the mail like that, I'd like to present to you. So, we up to all of you. Yeah, I think it. I think it's fair. Um, are we going to just do it with them and then wait and see if the other two? Nope. You could. We could have a motion to give a donation to all three if you want. <clears throat> Pine has come, yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, Mrs. Zeglin, can you hear me? Has Climber done anything at the elementary? I know both Pine and Cherry Hill have. No, she's still yes, on there. Yes, they have. Yes. Climber has also? Yes. Okay. 
I don't even remember. I'd have to look. I think there's three, there might be 3,000. All right, so we would give $100 to each other. Right? No. Yeah. No. Not at all. But it will not break us. And you know, I'm not one to get things to let people be. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of hard for me, but it's a good thing. And they do do something for us. Can I just okay. ask there what? What what amount are we saying, Mr. Lurch? Is my I don't think on so we weren't in, um what what amount we were talking about. Is your mic. That was a hundred dollars. Uh, 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 Wendy, I don't know if you can hear him. He, it's a hundred dollars per fire company. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> now we can hear you. Yes, you yes, yes, heard now. me now. It was a hundred dollars per fire company. <laughs> Start singing. I think they they did work with us providing the, the, the meals at, at those points. They did. All three did. They allowed us to use their yeah. locations. Yep. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. That that doesn't yeah. make sense. Yep. Okay. Any other questions, comments? <clears throat> okay, moving along, 12K, asking for your approval uh, for the Ignite Agreement for a Behavioral Therapist uh, that we've been using the past two years. Uh, total cost uh, would be $31,308.19. Uh, that is a 3% increase from the previous year. Uh, we use access funds uh, to pay for that uh, particular uh, agreement. Um, do you want to give any explanation of access funds? This is another <clears> one of those <throat> neat things. So uh, access dollars are the, um, you've heard of access, the, 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 the Medicaid service access across, across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, what, it, what it is, if you have an access eligible student who receives an access eligible service, um, that particular access eligible provider, whether it be a personal care assistant or a, um, um, an occupational therapist or a phys physical therapist, uh, once, or a speech language pathologist, something along those lines, um, when they re receive that service, that provider bills access for the service and we get a certain amount of money for providing that service. Uh, now, when I say we get money, it's actually deposited into an account that sits at the state. Okay, so we don't actually get that money. It doesn't come down to us as it's being billed, uh, but we can pull it down for certain services in special education. Uh, two years ago, we're in the second year, right? Mm -hmm. Two years ago, um, we, uh, the administrative team put together a plan to address some emotional and social behavioral problems here. Uh, and that included um, the contracting of a behavioral consultant and a behavioral therapist. Uh, the behavioral therapist was um, from Family Behavioral Resources, FBR, and the behavior, or is that the other way around? Behavioral therapist is Ignite, behavioral consultant is FBR. Okay, and so that was approximately $100,000 for both of those positions. Uh, and so what we have done for the last two years, last year and now this year, at the end of the year, we will bill access to get money out of our own account to offset those costs. And so I just sent Mr. Johnson an email the other day. We have enough money in enough funds in those accounts. Um, as long as we keep adding to it, which we do, uh, approximately $75,000 a year, we add to it. Um, we have an, and we have already about $230,000 in there. As long as we keep adding 70 or 75,000 to it, and we use the 230, we should have several years worth of this program, uh, enough money in there to pay for several years of this program. Questions? Okay, if not move along to 12-1 or 12-I or 12-L. If I can do my alphabet. Oh. I know, I had a had a brain stoppage there. Uh, prove Ignite Agreement uh, for Dropout uh, Prevention Program for next school year. Uh, that is, uh, again, through Ignite. Uh, we have that program located uh, at Admiral Perry. Um, and we have students uh, there every year. Uh, total cost uh, for that program would be $69,198. That includes the fee 
uh, for the room there, uh, also uh, the teacher, et cetera. Uh, and again, uh, we've sent students there. Uh, you may say, well, remind me of the type of student we send there. If a student uh, has failed uh, more than one time in a grade level, um, we actually look at that student as a tendency for that student to drop out of school. Uh, so we don't want that to happen. Uh, so we send that student uh, into that particular program uh, so that we can try to catch them up uh, so that they don't get far behind. Because just imagine if you were someone that had to sit in ninth grade for three years, um, uh, the likelihood of you carrying out uh, to get to the point of graduation is very slim. Uh, so that's what that program is in, is put in place for. Questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move along to 12M, uh, which is uh, approve revised Chromebook agreement. Uh, if you want to take a look uh, online or the program or the handout that is in front of you, uh, there's a hand or three lines uh, in that agreement uh, that we would like to change. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Gramling uh, if he wants to uh, highlight uh, those things that uh, we would like to change in that uh, technology protection plan. Um, so there, the changes that we're uh, proposing here <coughs> now is not really changing the program. Uh, it's just clarifying some language, uh, how the, we have perceived the program to work. I just wanted to put some more concrete language in. It was always our intention that if we replaced a Chromebook, that it would consume two of your claims because an individual plan gets two claims and a family plan gets four claims. So it was always the intention um, for those a replacement device to consume two plans, two claims. So it's just adding that language in there more concretely than uh, what was in there before. Uh, the other change, uh, the previous language said within 10 days of receiving your Chromebook, uh, just changing that language to no more than 10 days. The only reason for that change is we would like to send this form out over the summer so that give parents and uh, guardians more time to opt into that. You know, the student hasn't received their Chromebook over the summer, but if the parent has decided to enroll the uh, student in the insurance program, I didn't wanna have the language conflict with that. So by saying no more than we still uh, will not insure a Chromebook that's already been damaged by having it 12 days into the school year, but we allow that um, collection there. Uh, just adding uh, <laughs> Mr. Johnston and I as two people that can uh, make a determination on the uh, damages of a Chromebook. So uh, previously it was just the building principal uh, just to add those two people as backup in there. The other changes, uh, the Chromebooks have increased because of demand. So updating the price and the other changes are more um, clerical. We, when we've sent these out last year, we received multiple forms back for a family uh, enrolling in the family plan. So if they had four kids, sometimes we'd receive four forms back. So just adding the language that we only want one form and then some back office uh, so that we can record the payment before we were just writing on the bottom of that. So uh, just adding those fields so that we can do that stuff and track it in the back, so back office. Okay. And you want this back with a decline if necessary, right? Yeah, if they don't uh, opt for the uh, insurance, we would like the uh, decline, but if they don't uh, send anything back, we just assume that it's been declined. Mr. Gramling, how was the, uh, did you get a lot of cases, a lot of- We did uh, not. Um, so, you know, there, there was some students that did uh, take advantage of the program um we did not lose our shirt on the program it, it was not uh used as much as i thought it would uh 
you know, I was thinking we would have one student used for every two uh, that were enrolled. We weren't even close to that. So, uh, you know, I, I had presented uh, about halfway through that we were still um, like an 18th of the funds were still available and I, we haven't increased much since then. So. Has, were there any lost or stolen? Uh, we did have a few uh, completely destroyed Chromebooks. Um, I believe only one of those was replaced under the insurance plan. Uh, there was ones that did not have insurance that were destroyed. But. And, and we collect that $300? Yes. We have that process to do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, send an invoice home and and had them through that list until we get that thing. Okay. Any questions on that item? If not, uh, let's move to 12N, uh, approve Ed Leo Merchant Agreement. Uh, we have had uh, some discussion at the admin level. I think we've heard some people in the community, boy, wouldn't it be nice to be able to pay online? Uh, so I'm also going to refer to Mr. Gramling to talk about uh, the service that we would like your approval to add to the website. So Ed Leo is uh, the company that currently hosts our website. Uh, built into the website uh, has been this functionality to accept payment. Uh, they always used a third party processor. So those uh, fees were higher in the past. Uh, they have now taken on that uh, processing themselves and they uh, so that's what uh, spawned this. And uh, I met with them and they presented this plan uh, to be able for the parents to pay using credit card online. Uh, we would create a form uh, that the parent would then go on complete and be able to submit payment. Uh, there is a fee for it. Uh, so it's a 4% fee for percentage points and a 35 cent transaction fee. So if you want to refer to the very last page of that handout as he's going through that. So for instance, like a $10 charge would be a 40 cent transaction percentage charge and a 35 cent transaction fee. So that would be 1075. Um, the parent would pay. So, and then the school would get the $10 and between the credit card companies and Ed Leo, they would get the additional 75 cents. So that um, transaction fee is not borne by the district, it is borne by the uh, paid. And we just, you know, there are parents that are using the uh, cafeteria payment for this way. This is just an, a, another option for them to pay you know we're not doing away with them being able to send the cash or check in we're just giving them another option that from home they could pay with a credit card or debit card and they are responsible for paying the fee correct correct just from examples like what what other examples so uh all of our <clears throat> uh debt that anybody owes uh, so, for example, if uh, someone's damaged a textbook, teacher submits that into the office. Um, if there's any repayable situation that needs to take place, uh, that could actually be paid online uh, instead of uh, having to come in to each office and pay for that. Yearbook? Uh, we could put a yearbook on there. Didn't even think of that, but you're right. So it's no cost to the district, right? Is what we're saying? No, there would be no cost. Correct. Is it, I mean, we pay for the program, or is that the 35 cent transaction fee? Is Correct. that what pays for it? Yes. Yeah. So there's no upfront cost? No, no there's, there's no cost um, to use it. There's no cost um, to have it. it. Somebody could pay their insurance uh, program that way. Yes. And it would be very similar, correct, as you had indicated, uh, as someone can pay online for cafeteria. Now, no one's having experienced that this year, uh, but I can recall having two. I would pay mine online, and I was charged, I, I forget what percentage. 
So yeah, it'd be similar. Uh, like two fifty or something like that. Yeah. The payee would pay that thirty five cents. So we know. Correct. Correct. Yeah. There's zero cost. To us. Zero cost to us. And the only reason for this agreement um, is because they are adding us on to their merchant agreement that they have with the credit card company. So <clears> it's <throat> not. Uh, that's the reason for the agreement is that they just need to add us onto their master agreement. Would I'm sorry, Rich. Uh, would it be? Would we combine the the lunch program so we don't have two portals or? Uh, no, because that uh, that lunch portal feeds right into the cafeteria system. Okay. Um, to use this system for the cafeteria, you would have to have somebody uh, depositing the money into that from this payment source. So the cafeteria system would remain separate because it is managed all as one program. Now the cafeteria, does it come credit card only or can you put your bank account in? How does that work? It's been a while since I've okay, uh, but... made that payment, but I, I think it's just credit card. Josh yeah. will correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, just Yep. Okay. Or your bank card. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think if there if there is an opportunity to expand other items, um, uh, pictures, um, um, e even merchandise, uh, you have so many different teams that that, that sure. have things that they sell, and and. I don't know if you know you focus it down on one thing. You know, I, I think you could probably expand, possibly, but I guess that's an opportunity that was most people anymore with online shopping and everything. That's 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 mm -hmm. what it is. Oh, so, that's a lot. So I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, well, you know, I have a lot some experience <clears throat> with these merchant agreements, and, yeah. and it's is this the price for four percent and thirty five cent? We we don't want it to become too, even though we're not paying it. We don't want parents not to use it because it's too expensive. Is that price locked in in this agreement for a year? Because what I found is in six months, they just raise it a little bit. You know? uh, it is part of the agreement. Okay, so, so it is yeah. locked in. Um, and is that is there any negotiations? Because you know, I've seen them usually 3% or 2.5% and 30 cents. You know? No. <laughs> okay, you it, it has okay. come down from when they weren't uh doing it themselves okay but, uh, I, I think the other thing to think about when you're talking about lowering the merchant or the, the processing fee the large the larger volume of transactions that they process typically that fee comes down so with this new master agreement that they're putting together at leo uh if they get enough schools on board and it's being used i wouldn't be surprised if we see a decrease in the cost okay i just think this we're early on at this point and four percent is i think four percent is actually the highest any merchant can charge for processing transactions it just goes down from there okay that's what i thought i knew it was high but you know, i also know that after you get locked in you quit looking at the statement all of a sudden it goes up a little bit yeah you know? sure so I, I just want to make sure we're locked in so all of a sudden a parent doesn't call mr johnson and say holy mackerel i'm not using this anymore you know mm -hmm. yeah they do break that down that uh ed leo is taking 1.75 percent of that and then the credit card companies are getting two and a quarter percent. And then of course the 35 cent transaction fee is also going to the credit card companies. So, so yeah, Ed Leo is collecting the 1.75. Any other questions on that item? Okay, if not, uh, we will move along to the next one, approved server infrastructure uh, with uh, Link Computer Corporation. Um, and I will preface uh, what uh, Mr. Gramling is about to describe to you um, is in the uh, upcoming budget. Uh, so uh, I'm not even going to begin to explain the uh, technology uh, guru uh, that will let you explain all of that. Uh, but when you when you see the price tag, don't think that, uh, oh, here's Mr. Johnson coming again for uh, capital reserve. Uh, it is in the budget.
Um, so on the left hand side here, uh, showing what we currently have. So what the virtual server infrastructure is really referring to is we have 24 servers that run the district, uh, make sure the internet works, that monitoring that we talk about is part of this and you know file storage and everything. So within those 24 servers, they're all doing a different function, but the hardware is only a few devices that can house that. So we do have three servers that host those 24 servers. They, they just kind of fit in. Um, and one storage device where everything is stored. So you have the processing power and then the storage power just to run those uh, servers. What has happened, and it was expected that uh, the company that provides the support for the shared storage device has ended life that device. They will not provide any support uh, beyond this year. It is proprietary. So to try to run without support, if something broke, we would not be able to just get an off the shelf piece and fix it. Uh, we would have to try to part out. But as you see, there's a lot of redundancy in these three servers. You know, one can go down and the other two can take over the computing power, but there's only one storage device. So if we lost that storage device, uh, we would be down for some time until we could part out the pieces for that. So originally I looked at what it would take just to replace that and for five years, the cost to replace all that would be $157,710. That's uh, providing support for five years and the hardware cost to replace all that and ongoing licensing. There's a license that we pay for our backup and for the software every year. So that's a big chunk. Um, to look for it. So I started looking at other solutions as technology has advanced, what other solutions are out there. And a solution that uh, has been touted by Indiana School District and the uh, Director of Technology there, they're currently using the system and having a lot of success with it is scale computing. It doesn't have that one shared storage device, the storage is built into those nodes. And that allows it to share, you still have that same redundancy. Uh, with the added redundancy that the storage isn't all just in on one device. So the solution that we're proposing today would replace all the components. So not just the storage, but all the um, components, all the servers the switching and everything. There would be no licensing costs going uh, for the five years. And we'd have five full, five years of support on all the devices. And that uh, five-year cost is 54,480. So about a third the cost of replacing with a like uh, system for what we have now. And that would be able to do everything we're doing today. and there are uh, technology benefits to the new solution as well. Questions. Is there a salvage value to what we currently have? There really isn't. Um, so the hardware is five years old at this point. And what we will do is uh, use that hardware then for backup for um, backing those files up from that thing. So right now, the backup device that we're using is a device that was replaced with the old system, with the current system. So that system that we're using for backup is probably 10 years old. So we would retire that and use the current system as our backup. 
So I guess when we talk about a replacement of one system to the other, is this going to take, is it going to take up additional space? Is additional space required? Do you need another room? No, or? it'll probably take up less space. So um, same racks space and everything. So um, no additional space, no additional uh, resources would be required. Are they all in one place or are they building specific, uh, the three of them or? Yeah, uh, they would all, all be located right here in the server room um, by, my, by the NPR there. Got good roof over that. <laughs> yep, uh, good roof, redundant uh, cooling. So at, on the generator, so we can continue to run regardless of what's going on. I think what I've learned here tonight, Dave, is it safe to say that all technology has a life of about four to five years? Yes. Yeah. Um, diff that is. Um, that is the trend of technology to start end dating. So technology is moving to uh, service-based where you pay for a service. Sometimes that means an, a licensing cost. And at a certain point in time, they say, here's your end date. And that's what happened here. Uh, this is something I've been uh, looking at for a year because I knew this end date was coming. Uh, so that's why I had time to go out and look at all different solutions. There was another district that this happened to. They actually got end dated a year ago and had to had to make the left hand decision. I see because they didn't have enough time to research up. Mr. Larch, and let's just be clear: the end of life is arbitrary. It's manufacturer imposed. It's not like those things are just going to shut off on July one. What happens is those things go end of life unsupported. So if on July one and you're out of support and the hard drives crash on them you know uh, you know, oh yeah i have understand but even even the hardware we're talking about our chromebooks you know four yeah. years they're done seems like everything even cell phones yeah say, it's just okay, arbitrary so i think even it is an arbitrary number there is new things that are greater and better that can be put on these new devices sure so i guess you know i kind of learned something today you know stuff don't last forever uh, and technology has a shelf life Four to five years if you want the latest and greatest and best for sure to upgrade our stuff we like to keep our facilities upgraded it's good to keep our technology updated yeah. as well so just something to budget for something to right and when dave came to me about this i said well dave let's just let's just do one more year just let's do one more year he says well if the hard drives crash we're not we're going to be we're going to be down for months potentially finding these parts and so again could the system work another year yeah we they could but unfortunately we did there will be no support <clears throat> uh, gotcha. yeah yeah, and I do, so that's something I do take into account in the budget uh, is to plan these type of costs to spread them out. Um, so knowing that this was coming up, I made sure that there was nothing that would interfere uh, with that. So we know every five years we have to look at potentially this cost for yeah that's that's excellent planning what what about like our telephone system and stuff like that did we just do that not too long ago as well mm -hmm. so, yes. yeah we'll be replacing our telephone system this summer um we actually just sent in the termination for the mytel system that we're currently using for a july one termination and that'll be the turn up of the new system through cell so okay excellent okay just one other thing is we talked about this and budgeting and, and keeping up with all of this stuff. Are there grants available out there to help support the additional costs associated with IT and funding things? Specifically, I mean, we talked about safety grants. We talk about all these other things. I think as we continue to start looking down the road, moving forward, ramping things up mm -hmm. like this. If we do have those opportunities, because I would hate for some point in time, it's going to get, uh, you know, really expensive. And this is going to be a big component of a budget discussion at a point in time. I, I, I just, was, if, if that's something that needs to get on a radar somewhere, I think sure. that's, that, I think it's important to note, you oftentimes don't find grants to fund things that you already have in your building. Uh, we, we find grants for new things, especially federal funds. They want you to spend it on, you, you're required to spend it on new things. Uh, 
but when you're applying for grants and you do a lot of the grants so you can tell me if i'm wrong but when you're applying for grants it's often what is the new thing you want the money for not what is the thing you're already paying for uh, in terms of the the budget and, and paying for these things we've sat down dave and i and we have charted out how to replace things so that we're not coming to the board and asking for increases in his budget year after year after year right so if he replaces three grade levels of chromebooks every year and we know that that's going to happen every year but on the fifth year this has got to happen and on the 10th year that the network needs to be replaced and, and so on and so forth we've got that planned out and so i think you know phone system in six years whatever it might be i think um we won't be having these huge impacts because he's paying for this out of his budget and we have a plan for it a technology plan over the course of time people may be familiar though and have heard e-rate might want to talk about oh that. that's a good one yeah so actually you, you may have heard of e-rate if, if you pay a phone bill you you've you've actually been affected by e-rate because there's a dollar 50 surcharge on there that dollar 50 surcharge goes into a big pot of federal funds that is then dished out to school districts to pay for uh uh, technology. Now, what kind of, it's very targeted. There's actually two categories. Category one is what we call internal, or excuse me, external connections. Uh, and so we get E-rate funding for our internet connection that we get to this building. Um, as a matter of fact, the IU gets the E-rate funding and we just see the reduced cost, the discounted cost. Category two is internal connections. Um, things like network switches, wireless access points, uh, a variety of other things, but not this. Okay, this never qualifies. Uh, so I think the reason why it doesn't qualify, and I think the reason why you don't see grants to pay for these things, these are core things that every school district needs to have. E-rate doesn't pay for phone service anymore. E-rate doesn't pay for server infrastructure anymore. It, it doesn't but it pay did for, at one point. It did at one point. It did pay for phone yeah. service at one point, for sure. Cell phone service, phone service. It paid for all the pagers at one point. Uh, but all of that is, you know, and they've gotten away from all of that, and, and they pay for things that, provide you with internet i think one uh note about e-rate is that i did come to you when covid first started about moving up our timetable for the uh chromebook one-to-one -one and the different devices we needed the wireless devices to make all that work and we did leverage e-rate in that the remaining e-rate funds that were available at the time and we did receive twenty-seven thousand dollars back uh from e-rate in that expenditure um since then you know we were using up what was left in our pot of money that we were qualified for since then they have refreshed the category two funding uh so for the network uh expenditures that money has been refreshed and there is now a, a pretty hefty chunk that we could um but it is limited to those network devices that we are not we have no plan of changing up this year. Uh, we will be looking at that in next year's budget. But the uh, and why I say we're not replacing it next year and we're looking at or looking at it for next year is because E-rate requires the district to pay a certain percentage. So be, it's based on your free and reduced percentage. So we they would pick up eighty percent of the cost. We would have to pay twenty. So next year there will be room to replace those older network devices that um should be replaced by us picking up that 20 percent. we will be leveraging the rate money for that thanks i think it just uh, i'm glad there's some looking forward because <laughs> this can really catch up sure. and i remember buying my first phone at sam's club for 96 cents and then it, i dropped it and it broke so I thought, uh, you know, and then this was a seven hundred ninety nine dollar phone. So, you know, it, these these things are just sure. get out of hand sure. quick. Absolutely. Any other questions on that one? OK, moving along, uh, approve field trip requests. Uh, you can see those that are listed there uh, from the elementary school. Uh, so that will be a, a motion to approve those. And last one under new business, I'd already talked about it. Uh, that is you giving us permission uh, to advertise uh, for a four and a half hour cafeteria position uh, for beginning of next school year. Any questions on that one? As we're talking about uh, positions uh, in the budget uh, at one point in time, 
uh, Budget and Finance Committee. Recall uh, we had discussion about um, uh, elementary uh, teacher position. Um, and uh, just so that you know, uh, we always have the discussion of if a grade uh, is below 50, uh, per 50 students in a grade, uh, that we would have two teachers in that particular grade. Uh, so the grade that we thought uh, was going to be small, smaller than 50, uh, is now above 50. Uh, so uh, we will proceed and we do have in that budget, uh, that proposed budget, uh, that we will go ahead and post and advertise uh, for that position. A couple other things uh, that I want to talk about and open uh, just to tell you that uh, we're working on, uh, just to give you some background and what we'll be doing uh, within the next uh, 30 days or so. Uh, so feedback uh, on our Google Classroom, uh, folks. Um, and again, if, if there's any parent uh, that's listening uh, to this recording, uh, there's some of you uh, that haven't responded uh, so that uh, we need your input. Uh, at elementary, uh, we currently have eight students in Google Classroom. Uh, and speaking with those parents, five of those eight are returning to in-person next year uh, at the beginning of the school year. Uh, one person uh, is considering uh, to come to our cyber school. Uh, two have not responded at the elementary. Uh, so we'll continue to try to contact the parents of those two students uh, to get the answer on those. At the high school, uh, we have 43 students currently in Google Classroom. 12 of those students are graduating. 22 of them are returning to in-person next year. Uh, one of those students is not sure. Uh, two students did indicate uh, that they uh, would be going uh, to outside cyber um, and six have not responded uh, to that survey. So I uh, just wanted to give you background uh, that we are asking. Um, uh, a majority of the folks are returning uh, or graduating. Uh, and uh, we will continue in the next uh, 30 days uh, to get a hold of the last couple of folks uh, so we can move forward um, in our planning for next year's. But I just wanted to share that with you. Anything else for the open uh, session of the board? Uh, I do uh, need you to stay. I'll just update you on two legal things. Uh, two legal items, an executive session. Um, we got no birthdays in May. And Lisa, you'll have to turn in your birthday. Turn in. <laughs> uh, and an interesting thing, my neighbor, uh, next door neighbor, has got uh, five children, three of them here at school, just lamented she misses report cards. She loves seeing the children's eyes when they did well. And she loved seeing the children's eyes when they did pour the beer, I think. So I just thought that was an interesting take on that. Okay, anything else for open session? Sure, go ahead. Um, at our last Aaron meeting, um, they brought up something that I really wasn't aware of, but I know how the board, we appoint someone to Aaron, which that was me. But Aaron is the only entity that actually can approve the members. So did everybody get something in the mail from Aaron? Did you get something in the mail? They asked if I could just remind our members to please return those because it's important that they get those back. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much. And so we'll be back next Thursday for the business meeting.